So I need to start figuring out what the dynamic is for Patrick Mahomes after a game when he, the poor guy is out there battling. He's having a rough start to the year, so many interceptions, and he's got to go online and see his brother TikToking yeah. on Sean Taylor's number before the game. Yeah, brutal look there. His mom tweeting about his number one wide receiver and one of the best players in all football, Tyree Kill. And then who who knows what his fiance is doing at that moment and who she's waiting for Jackson to pour water on or whatever. I honestly, I, I it's getting to the point where I know we make fun of Aaron Rodgers a ton because he doesn't have family, he's basically ostracized his family. But Mo, I wonder if part of Mahomes' struggle this year is around like what is going on with this dude's family? Like, stop. Like you, you like if I'm Patrick Mahomes, I would I would have one big family meeting now and I would be like, this is it. Like Jackson, I, you're not coming to you're not coming to games anymore for like a couple of weeks. Like this this shit's gotta stop. Uh mom, delete Twitter right bleeping now. Like, like, and never say anything bad about Tyree Kill ever again. And wife, I don't know what you say to your wife, but uh you know, but I, I Well it's just I mean when you have that many people um, it's like making of, you look bad. It's well it's and like three of his closest people and they yeah. all are making him look bad. I mean Jackson Mahomes is like, I, I mean, I don't want to be too critical. The kids, I, I only think he's 21 yet. I mean, he's a kid, but it's one of those. Loose like, cannon, though. Talk about an all-time just like pariah for fans of a team. Like, uh, I mean, I, I get angry, and I'm not even a Chiefs fan. I can I can only imagine what like Chiefs fans would, would like feel like when they're losing games and you got Jackson Mahomes just TikToking his way, causing controversy on Twitter, man. It's crazy. It's interesting too because it's um, it doesn't jive with what we know about Patrick Mahomes. I know, like, like he can't, you know, so so much more mature, you know, coming into the league even than a lot of you know twenty one year old guys, and uh, you know he seems like really down to earth and all of that stuff. It, it's uh, it's an interesting contrast between the two. I will say though, uh, we can have some empathy as Bulls fans because there was kind of that thing with Derrick Rose, right, and his close family always kind of. Yeah. Being involved in, you know, not just like his money and stuff, but always saying stuff to the media and talking. So they were, I do. It did kind of, it does kind of strike that chord with me at least. Um, That's that a great comparison. I mean, in Patrick's at the first one, I mean, obviously Zach Wilson's dealt with it with his mom, like is a young right. quarterback already. Um, and it's just one of those things is, is as social media grows and all these platforms grow and, the access that fans have to get closer to players. It was one of the things I always credited Mitchell Trubisky about that dude is not on social media. He never like, he, he like rarely posts. You could tell all of his posts are like basically sponsored posts. I always felt good about that, especially being in a giant market. Like he was at a tough market and like not playing well. I mean, Patrick's just get like the, this it's relentless. I mean, it, we never talked about how his brother poured the water on those fans a couple of weeks ago. And right. all that went viral. I mean, I, I had a feeling this is going to be one of those things where when you're winning and if the Chiefs were 6-0, and oh, I'd be like, whatever, who cares? But when you're losing and you're having a, a, a your worst season so far as a pro and you're the heir apparent to the GOAT, I, if I were Patrick, I'd, I'd be nipping this shit in the bud quick. No question. Yeah, that's problematic. And uh, it just compounds the problem when you're losing, like you said. Yeah. So. Definitely agree with that one. All right. Well, welcome everyone to the football lounge here. I'm Dan. He's Mark as always. And uh, here we are with our week six recap. And before we kind of get into the the weeds of the uh, week six NFL games, which uh, there are quite a few, we, we've talked so far, Mark, about how there have been a lot of games every week. Like we've had uh, great, you know, talking points, I guess, from week one to where we are now. This week, quite a few more duds than we're used to. Um, but that, you know, that that just comes with the, sometimes the slate of NFL games. Uh, but there were still a couple real close games and some interesting ones uh, to come out of as well. So we have plenty to talk about. But um, before we get into all of that, obviously, huge news has um, come down since we last spoke here last Monday. Yeah. Of course, the 
email situation with John Gruden was just kind of beginning. Uh, we were getting a few leaks at that point. But since then, John Gruden has resigned after uh, a bevy of problematic emails, uh, exchanges with, you know, Bruce Allen, the former executive of the Washington football team, and several others uh, involved. And, um, you know, obviously ranging from misogyny to racism to, you know, everything in between. And uh, so he has since resigned, unsurprisingly. But great news, Mark, is that apparently, according to an AP source, there are no other problematic emails in the it's entire 650,000 <laughs> that uh, were uh, taken on, in the independent investigation. It's such a large number of emails, too. It's uh, almost, you know, what, almost, you know, three quarters of a million emails. And only John Gruden said horrible things, apparently. Right, apparently, out of all of them. You know, my biggest takeaway from this story, first and foremost, uh, if you would ask me a couple of days ago before that AP report was, it's just the tip of the iceberg. I still really believe that deep down that this is a tip of the iceberg type of thing. But the other thing I want, I, well, I think it's very clear to me. It may not be clear to every one of our listeners. It may not be clear to you, but I'm just going to make my case for it. And I just, you know, it, if you, you can burn me at the stake, whatever you want to do, come at me on Twitter. I'm, I'm happy to explain it more, but I, I'll try to lay it out here. I think this is the people who are crying cancel culture, I think are so off base with this, with what happened with John Gruden. I will say this. John Gruden is not a victim of cancel culture. No. John Gruden said horrific things in the privacy of what he thought were things that would never, ever get out. And we've all have skeletons in our closet. That's not the thing. We all have things that we've done that we don't, we're not necessarily proud of. John Gruden, over the course of seven years, uh, in these email chains from 11 to 2018, I mean, this was multiple, multiple instances and attacking different groups. This is clearly a guy who feels very comfortable saying these things that are derogatory that you would never say in front of a microphone. You would never say in the public eye. And John Gruden doesn't lose his job because of the fact that he was doing those emails. John Gruden loses his job because they come public. Now, is that John Gruden's fault? No, they were looking into the Washington football team. And this clearly someone who was a part of this investigation, let things get leaked because they had an out for John Gruden. And maybe they thought this was something that was a long time coming anyways. And that John's behavior in the background of NFL circles, they knew maybe would catch up to him anyways. So they thought, let's just drop this bomb now and we can get rid of Gruden. But here's the thing. It's not cancel culture. John Gruden had to resign, and he resigned smartly because you're in a position of power where you need respect from people and you need people to trust you at your word and to follow you. And when you come out and it comes out that you have used that language and you think these ways, you feel these ways, you can no longer lead a locker room of men, right. especially a locker room of very diverse men. And uh, the Raiders, a great example of it with Carl Nassib. But as, as the NFL is, is growing in that diversity, uh, adding Mexican-born players, adding more foreign-born players. We saw it with the, the South Korean kicker for the Atlanta, uh, Kim, and they were how they were showing that game in South Korea because of what he was playing in, in, uh, in England. Like, they're trying to grow the game globally. And if you're attacking different races, different ethnicities, different uh, people of sexual orientations, and now people know that you feel this way, you can't be a leader of men anymore. So he, in a sense, he canceled himself because if you feel that way, you can keep your job as long as people don't know about it. And as long as you do your job, whatever. But now that people know about it, you have no credibility left to have that job. He can have a job elsewhere, be a podcast host, do whatever he wants. But to be a leader of men in a locker room, you can't have that job if people know that's who you are at your core. It's just more information that has been provided now to an employer and to uh, your employees that wasn't known before. So yeah. if you bring this information that wasn't known before to a job interview, are you getting that job? Maybe not, you know? And yeah. so that's the whole point about all of this is it's more information to people who want to cry, um, you know, judgment as if people have no place to judge. I, I find a lot of those kind of ridiculous because we all judge. It's just based on the scale at which it's done. But the point, the point being, everyone wants to say, oh, everyone's got problematic emails. I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, it's not a holier than thou thing. I would, I am not fearful 
at all. Yeah, you can anyone look at my seeing email. any of my emails. Yeah, ever, I agree. Or I any agree. or even messages. You know, like yeah. so I like I don't understand that type of thing. It's like everyone's like, oh come on. You're basically admitting to us all then that <laughs> yeah. you have problematic emails yeah. as well. I, I just don't get it. And and obviously as we mentioned, it was not an isolated incident. It was over several years. It was a pattern it, uh, displaying, you know, someone's personality and kind of their characteristics. And on top of that, he wasn't a 12 year old that tweeted those things. He was, you know, 48 at the time man, or yeah. whatever it was. So anyway, that wraps all of that up. Oh, I will say actually to tie a, a wrap a bow around this whole thing. Um, my bold st- uh, prediction still stands because the man resigned. He was not fired. And yeah, therefore technically. coaches have not yet been fired during this NFL season. I, I'm going to maintain that on a technicality. Brian Flores is uh, is getting the seat hot, though. That's that's <laughs> very true. That, that, it's very hot, and there are a couple other seats that are. Warm I agree. Well. Yeah. So let's get into it, Mark. Our Week Six recap. We'll start with Thursday Night Football: Buccaneers twenty-eight, Eagles twenty-two. Bucks, you know, barely edging Philly in this one on Thursday night uh, by six points. But you know, a win's a win, obviously. Um, Eagles defense, we thought, you know, had uh, taken, you know, steps forward, uh, really didn't look so hot in this one. And it was kind of the Leonard Fournette show, Mark, uh, without Rob Gronkowski, uh, excuse me, can't talk today, Rob Gronkowski there. Uh, they had to rely on some other weapons, obviously, and they have plenty of them, but it was Antonio Brown, Leonard Fournette really dominating in this one. Did the presence of Leonard Fournette and the way he was able to run uh, pr- really for the first time, Tampa looking like they could consistently run the football, uh, to me, that was probably the biggest thing that stood out. What did you make of that in terms of the makeup of this team in general and what they can do? Yeah, I I think it was um, a really great game plan for Tampa. And, and even though the score becomes closer at the end, I mean, Tampa was really in control of this game for a lot of it. I'll say for Tampa, it's a good road win. And they, to me, it was the first time I really th- felt this season. It was like a Bruce Arians, uh, uh, Tom Brady, Byron Leffords. They all kind of came together and said, listen, Let's not be dumb. Their run defense is bad right now. They're missing their stud in the center. Let's just run the ball, get out of dodge, and not get anyone else injured. I mean, that's what that game plan felt like, and it, they executed it very well. And 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 so great win for Tampa because it's it's one of those where it's like just keep the wheels churning, baby. You know what I mean? Like you're in a good spot. You're in the driver's seat. You don't want to hiccup on a Thursday night in Philly. I will say this for Philly. The one thing that everyone wants, everyone wants us to have a strong opinion on is Jalen hurts. The guy can Jalen hurts be the guy. And I don't know. It's just, it's too hard. The game planning is so terrible. How do you not run miles Sanders more? He need like, I look at the, the, the week, uh, the week, the win for the bears against the lions and against um, the Raiders. If you give Jalen hurts that game plan, do this, this Philly win those games like this? You know what I mean? Like, like he, I feel like they're just asking him to do way too much, but he is in a dynamic playmaker around the goal line. I mean, you see it with his two rushing touchdowns. I really, I feel strongly that Jalen hurts is one of those guys where he's going to need things built around him like any young quarterback. Um, but it's just, they're just not doing a good enough job game planning right now. And that's only going to leave Philly to be in more of a uh, asking question marks by the end of the year. So uh, they have got to figure that out. They've got to build game plans that protect him, that help him grow. And don't just ask him to take bomb shots and then hopefully rush for a couple of touchdowns when they get in the red zone. Right. Yeah, no, he's a tough one to gauge for sure. And I agree when you got offensive line issues, yeah. the, the, the number one thing you got to do is try and find a running game somewhere to help set up the pass and, and give him a little bit more room back there to make things happen. Lane Johnson will be returning to the lineup he announced today after an absence there uh, for personal reasons. So that will be big for them and maybe give them that stepping stone that they can use, but definitely got to get your hands in the playmakers on your team more off the ball in the hands of your playmakers. And uh, Miles Sanders, certainly a playmaker for the Eagles. All right, let's, let's get right to it. Mark, uh, the Packers at the bears 24, yeah. 14 win for green Bay. Uh, obviously a close game, really. I mean, you know, kind of back and forth there with the Bears, especially in the first half, second half. Uh, Bears defense makes some plays as well, but the Packers just make enough of them to get the victory here. Five yards per carry for Green Bay really stood out in this one. And obviously the line from Aaron Rodgers when he gets that rushing touchdown late, the I still own you uh, shouting at the Bears fans there that, uh, that had to just be like twist the dagger there. 
Well, I feel like Bill Murray in Groundhog's Day. I mean, it's just like it's, yeah, it's relentless. Every- it's it, it's the same thing over and over and over again. And you know what? Um, I thought overall this game, uh, there was things that I I take away positively from it because, listen, I've seen so many Bears Packers games where it's thirty one to seven in the third quarter with Aaron Rodgers because he's just destroying the back end and throwing bombs. I thought I thought Mac. I thought Quinn, I thought Hicks all had great games for the up for the front seven. I thought I just think that they were then asked to do too much. And your defense has to play 85 Bears, 01 Ravens, you know, 13 Seahawks great to 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 beat Aaron Rodgers with a with an offense that's struggling. Um and and that's just too much to ask consistently. Um I still think the Bears offense this they took a step back in the sense that Remember what I said last week, how much I was just like, I was going like crazy for how much you kept hearing 64 reporting eligible. Alex Barnes that kept bringing in that extra tackle eligible. He was in on 27% of the plays against um, uh, offensive plays against the Raiders. He was only that dropped down to like 15, 16% against the Packers. You just can't do that. The game plan was working one out of every four plays you should have six offensive linemen in there. And that four should be when you're on third down and eight and third down and seven. They got two, they got two Q with their protections again, because I think they thought that the, the defensive line was too beat up for green Bay. And while I thought the offensive line did an okay job enough, there was too much outside pressure around the tackles that made Justin Fields, you know, go to the right or go to the left. And he is not seeing the field clearly enough yet with a game plan enough yet. To when he scrambles right or left, he either just needs to take off right away or he needs to throw it away. There's too many where he just – it's its moving too quickly, you can see, for him. That's okay because he's a rookie quarterback and he's going to learn from this. But you have got to help him as offense coordinator. The first time I thought Bill Lazor in his three games now had a bad day where I was like, this is not a great day. Good moments, good opening drive, good scripted plays, but overall a struggle of a day. I don't want to take too much from it. I mean, the Packers beat the Bears. What can we say? Their, their rec- the Bears' record against the Packers in the Aaron Rodgers era is abysmal. Uh, it is the one thing that every head coach in the past 20 years, you know, since Lovey Smith especially has failed to do, is beat the Packers consistently. Matt Nagy is just another example of that. That's got to be priority number one, right? I mean, when Lovey had his press conference, he said, you know, their number one goal is to beat Green Bay. Yeah. And that's, you know, that has to be the mentality if you're in Chicago. Obviously, um, they, they could have potentially won this game it was yeah. close um but yeah they they asked too much from their defense i will say the one thing about fields that i've kind of noticed and you know obviously he's young he's gonna grow into these things but a lot of times and and i think i see it i see this with baker as well is when they try and bail a little bit too early and they bail outside instead of stepping up and then bailing forward yeah and so like there was Agreed. a big sack that kenny clark had on fields that could have been avoided if he stepped up and ran you know, in, in between the tackles and found a gape, uh, a gaping hole there instead of yeah. uh, rolling outside uh, that, that can be problematic at times when you're trying to extend the play, but I couldn't agree learn. more. I couldn't agree more. He needs to be a little bit more. They just need to tell him a little bit more, be decisive. And if you're going to scramble, we want you scrambling North South. Don't scramble yes. East West and these long loop. He's not he, Kyler Murray, you know, no, you, you yeah. can, and he's straight line speed fast. That's, yeah. that is, that's field strength. And I think he's realizing pretty quickly how fast these defensive ends are in the NFL. And it's, it's so, but again, only going to learn from doing last, last little point I'll say on this game is I do think though, if you look around a lot of the other scores, when you get to in the league does say something about the bears and where they are, as far as their journey to, 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 try to get one of those uh, wild card playoff t- uh, seeds. They, a, a lot of other teams are getting blown out. They held their own with a very good team. And now it was at home, but this defense is for real. They lead the league in sacks for reason. They're biting with sharper teeth this year than they have been the past two years. And that's a good sign for the bears as far as them improving towards the playoffs. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you'll take that any way you can get it. So that's, um, that's a big boost to them. I still think they're they're a team that can compete for the playoffs, and that's really all you could ask at this point of the season. Just hope Justin Fields continues to stack on top of uh, you know what he's already learned in his yeah uh, few starts so far. Herbert looked good too. The rookie running backs. Bears got a lot of running backs. 
Yeah, he, he, that guy, he's got some speed, huh? He, he yeah. definitely had a nice um, you know, to him. cutback, uh, big big gain on, the, on a cutback run there. So, yeah, that looks good. They got some depth there in that backfield. And they, they need it, uh, clearly. But um, get, get Montgomery back, and they're even more of a force. So uh, let's rewind the tape a little bit back uh, to the uh, Sunday morning game in London, back-to-back weeks there yeah. for the London games. Dolphins, Jags. This game actually goes down to the wire. I think London fans actually got, you know, treated to uh, at least a, you know, a nice competitive game and a fun one. Uh, the Jaguars win 24 to 20, uh, getting their first win and snapping that long losing streak. Trevor Lawrence, Urban Meyer, that era, finally getting that first win under their belt. Uh, anything stick out to you on this one? I know we talked about Brian Flores and, and how that yeah. speed is getting hot. What, what sticks out to me is that I actually thought Tua played okay in this game and it still just seemed like, there's just no juice at all for Miami. I, I think this game says a lot more about Miami than Jacksonville. Jacksonville's going to continue to struggle to get wins, and you could just feel that the locker room, it wasn't like a rally around win. It, it felt very hollow uh, in a lot of ways. But Lawrence continues to impress, and I still think what he's doing with how dysfunctional the Jags are right now should be commended. Uh, I, I really do. I, 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 I have no worries about Trevor Lawrence still so far about my confidence in that he'll figure it out. And he's going to be a very good quarterback in this league that I will say the thing that comes to mind for Miami is everyone's now you're just seeing all this stuff about like, Oh, Deshaun Watson, Deshaun Watson. You got to remember Deshaun Watson has a no trade clause and Miami's now it's just starting to do themselves a disservice to where it's like, why would I want to join you? What do you do? What I thought you were supposed to be this defensive team that I could just help the offense and all we need to do is score 20 points and we'd win a bunch of games 20 to 13 because this defense is really good. They just look all sorts of out of whack from top to bottom. And I, I don't know what, what's going on because I really thought highly of Brian Flores, but this I think reflects a lot on him. I mean, everyone's dealing with injuries. It's the NFL. I don't want to hear that as an excuse. You're, you're just playing really bad football right now. Undisciplined do. Yeah. Yeah. And the defense, I mean, we, we've been talking about it for a couple of weeks now. I mean, this is a, you, the defense had continued to grow over the past couple of seasons under Flores. And you could yes. see that, you know, his impact on the game was coming to fruition. Now it seems they're taking a step back. It, it, we'll see. We'll see if Tua can actually get things rolling. He's obviously really not been able to garner any momentum in his NFL career so far. And that's been due to injury. So if he can start maybe stacking a couple games here of good performances, this team can, can turn things around and actually get in the win column and, uh, and move forward there. But yes, Brian Flores uh, currently his seat warming up at the very least. It has to be. And I hate to say that because I really, yeah. I really liked him, but I mean, it, it, at this point in time, you're just falling apart. Now they do have, the Falcons next week, the Dolphins, and then the Bills, Texans. But I mean, you know, it, it, it's they, it's a tough. It's, tough. They're 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 in they're in you know red button panic mode right now. Yeah, there's no question about that. Um, all right, the Bengals on the road at Detroit. We've talked about how Detroit's been very competitive, uh, pretty much every game this season. Yeah. Well, that kind of ended here. Uh, in week six, Bengals put a hurting on them 34 to 11. Joe Burrow, three touchdowns. Uh, Joe Mixon had a field day with the Detroit defense. So all in all, it was uh, pretty much entirely Cincinnati in this one. Detroit really struggling uh, to get anything going and certainly not Jared Goff's day. No, Jared Goff had a bad day. But again, you asked him to throw the ball 42 times at home against a Bengals defense that uh, stopping the run isn't exactly their forte. Uh, the Bears gashed them through the run. Uh, the you know the the Packers uh, ran the ball well against them last week as well. So I didn't love the game plan, uh, but I got to say I felt more. My takeaway from this game, the biggest thing I I, I thought was this is a ni- it's a nice win for the Bengals. I mean, this is a game that you would historically think, oh, well, this is going to be the Bengals, you know, on the road, be low scoring, but. Clearly now you're starting to see this Bengals offense is starting to really click and become a, a an elite offense in this league. They have so many wide receiver weapons with Higgins and Chase. Uh, I still really like um, uh, uh, Boyd for them as well. Joe Mixon, a great, great running back. Uh, this Bengals team is feisty. It's interesting. And I think it was a good win for them against a Detroit team that, I again, I still believe that they're headed in the right direction, but they just lack a lot of wide receiver talent. They need one or two pieces. They need one or two wide receivers. They, uh, 
uh, and, uh, and and they and they just need some. I, I I know they need a dynamic playmaker on offense because they got nothing right now. Yeah, it's it's been s- tough sledding for them, and I think that's you know just the skill position itself um, is, is not great for Detroit. But you know they got some time. I would say you know my my thoughts on them kind of haven't changed at all. They they're still what they are. They play physical. You know DeAndre Swift's a good talent. Yeah. So I think you know as the year goes on with Jared Goff, he gets more comfortable in a new system. You know, maybe by year's end, they start to put things together. And then next year is really the year that they can actually get, you know, quite a few wins, not going to say a playoff team, but you know, enough wins to, to show that they're heading in the right direction. Uh, Texans go on the road to the Col. Oh, meanwhile, the Bengals second in the division right now, four and two. Yeah, so four and two. That's uh that's, that's big for them in the AFC North uh, Texans go on the road and fall to the Colts in an absolute just dominant performance by Indy 31 to three. You know, obviously the Houston's defense has been playing actually better this season than I think a lot of people would think, or, or even yeah. that, that going into the year that we thought, um, you know, their issues would be uh, all that being said though, the Colts really are starting to put things together. You know, Carson Wentz looked really good at times. Jonathan Taylor is obviously, you know, one of the more, a surefire running backs in the league that can handle a three down workload. And then they have other, you know, guys like, you know, Pittman, uh, T Y Hilton came back for this game. Naeem Hines is there. It just seems like a lot of things coming together, albeit against a Houston Texans team to still win 31 to three. That's a, that's a pretty big gap there. And the Colts certainly covered for sure. Well, yeah, I think the, listen, the Colts um, it's, it's a great win for them because again, at the beginning of the year, if you're a Colts fan, you're circling these two Texans games as wins. They got to be wins. So to get them done and to get them done in a very effective manner. Also, it's a confidence build bo- booster. Sometimes you just need to, when you're when your defense, it's good, but has been struggling. You just need to go off on a bad team. I think this will help the Colts, pro- Colts propel them a little bit. And for Carson Wentz, listen, as hard as we've been on Carson Wentz so far this year, He's he hasn't necessarily been winning them games, but he hasn't been losing them games. And that's right, what, which we, is what we he's were been on him hard in Philly last year. So I do got to give him that credit. Only the one interception and nine touchdown passes. He's not lighting it up, but they only made him throw the ball 20 times. They're really controlling that building his confidence up as well because the talent's still there. You still see the talent with Wentz. So it's a, a fascinating dynamic. Great win for the Colts. Absolutely. For sure. And, uh, you know, that's like you said, it's a springboard and it's a momentum builder. So that's, yeah. that's a big thing there for Wentz and company, uh, not turning the football over. That's what you need out of this guy that you hope can lead this franchise, uh, to another Super Bowl. Rams on the road at the giants. I mean, this was pretty predictable 38 yeah. to 11 victory for Los Angeles and Mark, I, for, for those of you listening or watching, if you don't follow NFL Scoregami on Twitter, you got to check it out because it's always fascinating. They basically track all the scores of the games to find out if uh, a unique score is had uh, by the final of every game. This game was the only Scoregami of the week. It is the 1,067th unique final score in NFL history. It's amazing in all the years that we're still getting unique. Never scores had 3811. Never had 3811. So pretty impressive stuff there. Pretty cool. But yeah, obviously the, you know, the story of the day is Matt Stafford, once again, dominating four touchdowns in this one and the giants, you know, we thought maybe they turned the corner this year. It seems like they're turning the wrong corner and going backwards. Unfortunately, Matt Stafford, I think he's got like the sixth best odds right now to be MVP. I might start sprinkling a little money on that. Yeah. That seems a bit low four touchdowns, one interception. I think the Rams, because that loss to Arizona, They lost a little shine just in the national media. Um, But, and obviously Arizona deserves a lot of credit. We'll talk about them coming on up and Lamar Jackson has been great. There's been other uh, great storylines, but this is one of those games where it's like, if you're a Rams fan, it's got to feel so good because it's such a trap game where you're like, we should beat the piss out of the giants. We're really beat up right now. But then you're always back in the head. You're like, God, I really hope we do though, because your West coast team going all the way to the East coast, early start time and the Rams just totally took care of business Four touchdown passes for, uh, for Stafford. He's looked good. Uh, bounce it back. They're just stacking wins. Kind of all felt a lot like this, how I felt like with the bucks, just get that win, move on, whatever you got to do, get that win, get back uh, to what, to the games that are going to matter divisional games. Uh, so great for the Rams. Keep rolling. 
Yeah, they, they keep on rolling, and they're still – I mean, I know a lot of talk's been about Dallas and things like that. I still think the Rams are the best team in the NFC. I mean, that's just – from a complete picture, I feel like we're seeing that. You know, Tampa yeah. uh, is, is a very close second in my mind, but the Rams seem to have it more together. And and it's worth mentioning, you know, I'm not saying he's Todd Gurley, but Daryl Henderson is oh, very talented. Oh, my fantasy I mean, team. Yeah, I love it. mine too. I, it was, yeah. He's been dominant. And obviously, you know, he's had his injury – uh, history but you know when cam Akers goes down you think man is this team really going to take a big hit in the run game it seems like they haven't and so when you have to worry about all the weapons that this team has the last thing you want to worry about is also a very dynamic running back that can beat you uh, with a you know a swing pass in the flat or just running up the gut he's very talented this team's just got a well-rounded group of skill players for sure yeah, I mean, really quickly, right now, Matthew Stafford on the Barstool Sportsbook app, which is one of the one I bet with, he's plus 1,100, six best odds. Um, Kyler Murray's wow. best odds at plus 300. MVP, we're talking Josh Allen, plus 350. Dak Prescott, plus 600. Tom Brady, plus 700. Aaron Rodgers, plus 1,000. And Stafford, plus 1,100. I just have a feeling, uh, you know, all of a sudden, the, in a couple of weeks from now, you could see Matthew Stafford being closer to plus 300. You might be able to get him now and put, you know, put a shekel or two plus 1100 right now. I, it's not a bad, not a bad future bet. Juicy odds right there. I'm liking it. Very good stuff. All right. Chiefs go on the road uh, to Washington and put a hurting on the football team. 31 to 13 early on Mark. It seemed like hey, Washington, their defense, maybe the defense is finally having its redemption story. And uh, it did you know, have its moments certainly in this game, but Kansas city goes on to score 21 unanswered after being down 13, 10 at the half, it was 21 unanswered points for Kansas city. And then they just go on to win it. 31 to 13 is the final. Uh, obviously Antonio Gibson got hurt in this game for Washington. Yeah. Uh, that's tough to see that stress fracture in his shin doesn't seem like that's going away anytime soon, but it just never really felt like even at halftime, you're like, you know, Kansas city, they're going to explode at some point. They did cash in on a couple big plays there. And that ended up being the difference maker outside of all the other noise with his uh, Mahomes' you know, siblings and family and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I don't we we talked about that. I don't need to touch on that, but I will yeah. say this. I am very impressed with the Chiefs because at halftime, I'm sitting there looking at this. Pedro has got two interceptions. Their season is, you know, starting to like talk about the pressure they must have felt. You're two and three. You're underperforming at halftime. The, 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 you're staring at the faces going two and four and losing to the football team on the road. And for them to come out and have the second half they did, that a ton of credit given to them uh, to turn it around at halftime like that and get that W. Um, I will say for Washington, at this point in time, do you start considering if you're the football team we need to be, we need to be in the running for a top five pick for a quarterback. Like we just need to reset. And, and, and do you have to say to yourself a lot like the bears did with Chuck Pagano last year? Hey, I know what you did for us was great last year, uh, Jack Del Rio, but this isn't working and, and whatever it is, is not working. We have the talent. We're not getting enough out of the talent. So I think it's you're almost getting to that point now with how Dallas is running away. And Dallas's schedule is still very easy because remember they didn't win the division, so they don't have that that number one schedule. We talked a, a ton about Dallas's schedule and how easy it is for them. They're going to keep stacking wins. I don't know if Dallas is that great, but they're going to keep stacking wins. So it, it you're starting to stare if you're the Washington Football Team like where are we going existentially now as a franchise with all the email stuff? You like your head coach, you like your defensive personnel besides that, I don't know what else you do. Yeah. There's, they're going to have to find a lane here pretty soon. And it, you Agreed. know, this, this was a game where it's set up like, Oh, for a quarterback, even if you guys are working with a backup or whatever, this, this is a game where they should be frothing at the mouth because of how bad Kansas city Kansas secondary city. was. Yeah, I know. And, and to only be able to muster 13 points in this one, even if we're talking about a Washington offense, that isn't that dynamic. They still got Terry McLaurin, Antonio Gibson, J.D. McKissick. Like, they got yeah. these playmakers. They should have been able to put up more points. I imagine if Ryan Fitzpatrick was in this game, we would be talking about a different type of game here. But, yeah, they got to figure out what they're doing because Ryan Fitzpatrick's not the future. And right now it's looking like Taylor Heineke might not be the future either. Yeah, Still got to give him some more games here, but it's not looking great so far. Vikings uh, go on the road in 
Carolina and take on the Panthers. And it's an overtime victory, one of three overtime games this week. Vikings win 34-28 to on a Kirk Cousins to K.J. Osborne touchdown pass in OT. Eight drops, Mark, by Panthers receivers in this one. I mean, to be like, obviously, Sam Darnold did not play well in this game. I mean, he yeah. was not. He made poor decisions, was not aided at all by his Panther receiving core. That eight drops in a game is the sixth most over the last decade in a single game. So that just tells you how bad it was per uh, Mike Renner PFF there, by the way, for the shout out of the stats. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously that's a factor. Um, and, uh, you know, Matt rule, they without Christian McCaffrey for the next three games. Uh, and now you're with Christian McCaffrey. It's one of those things where the best ability is availability. And this guy has got to have a really great second half of this season. And he has got to have a really good next year as well for me to feel good about Christian McCaffrey again, as far as I know he's a super talent, but you're paying him a lot of money and you're, you're, you know, that's one of the reasons why you went out and got a Sam Darnold because he's cheap to pair though with your expensive running back and you build around and uh, it's leaving the Panthers now on a three game losing streak. And they're in a weird spot. They're in a really, really weird spot. I felt good about them bouncing back against uh, the Minnesota and for Minnesota though, I got to give them credit. I've been trying to write off Minnesota since day one. They've battled their way to three and three. They're they're not out of it by any stretch of the imagination. They have had a roller coaster of a season so far. I still don't know what Minnesota does really well, except for put up passing stats with their two good wide receivers and their uh, their quarterback who who's very accurate and he and he knows their offensive system well. I don't feel good about Minnesota. They're, you know, they're not in my Super Bowl plane still. They're they're just not. Uh, they're not even on standby. I, I have a feeling, though, we're going to still see the Bears end up with a better record in Minnesota at the end of the year. I stand by that firmly. But this is a good road win for them against the Panthers team that seems to be spiraling a little bit. Yeah, it's it's been a tough go the past few weeks for the Panthers. Obviously, you, you see how much Christian McCaffrey means to them. Their defense still making big plays, just maybe not enough here. Uh, to win this one, especially late and in OT. Dalvin Cook, on the other hand, though, was, uh, you know, phenomenal for Minnesota. Yeah. Obviously, he's he's the guy. I think that's their formula. If Minnesota wants to keep on winning, it, it's just feed Dalvin Cook. The guy had 140 yards to, and, and a touchdown. He's just so good and so talented in, in so many different areas of the game. Got to feed that guy as much as possible. Um, and, you know, I, I do credit Carolina. They made an incredible uh, late fourth quarter drive, yeah. 96 yards, Sam Darnold couldn't two fourth down conversions, including a fourth and 10 backed up in your own four. Uh, so a lot, a lot of good things to come out of this game, but still you lose your three and three, probably not feeling so great after that hot start for the Panthers chargers go on the road to the Ravens. And what we all expected to be a phenomenal game. Mark was actually the complete opposite. It was an absolute blowout by the Ravens here, 34 to six. They made Justin Herbert, Look pedestrian in this game. Ravens defense was uh, dominant, and Lamar goes on to pass Dan Marino for the most wins before the age of 25, his 35th regular season victory. The dude's just unstoppable, man, and and I think uh, you know he should be the front runner for MVP right now. The way the Ravens have been playing, especially the past three weeks. Yeah, I mean he is extraordinarily impressive. Uh, there's not enough adjectives you could say about Lamar Jackson. What I what I love so much about Lamar is that you can tell it's just all about football for him. Like he is 100%. just that he is a, there's nothing, you know, he plays really flashy, but he himself isn't flashy. It's really a unique skill set. And I got to be honest, the way he's passing the ball is, is the type of thing where it's like someone has gotten in his ear really well. And, and he, and his work ethic at what, at whatever combination it's been, because he's, it's starting to show like, Oh, for a guy, I thought Lamar Jackson would have, a very Cam Newton-esque career where it shines really brightly for seven years and then it fizzles really quickly because injuries will catch up eventually. But if Lamar Jackson can continue to take care of his body and elevate his accuracy and his passing and keep his shoulders healthy and from taking the hits like Cam did, I mean, the sky's the limit for this kid to keep having an incredible year, an incredible career. I will say that on the other end, I'll give the Chargers a little bit of a break. Well, as much as I think the Chargers are a very good team, we I think we all got caught putting the cart before the horse. He's a second-year quarterback. This was an L.A. team 
on an East Coast early start in Baltimore against a very good defense uh, with a rookie head coach. Like, that's going to happen. Like, that's one of those uh, I'm not panic button against the Chargers. That's going to happen. You're going to lay an egg every once in a while. You're going to get caught off guard. And right now, I didn't think it was I – didn't, I didn't think the Chargers were better than the Ravens before this game. Certainly feel good about the Ravens being – in the elite category, the Chargers being in the very good category of the AFC. If you're the Chargers, you're still, you know, hanging on to that first place in the AFC yeah. West right now, and that that is important. But Kansas City gets a game closer. Uh, you know, obviously this is a win you want and for so do the know, numerous reasons. But yeah, the raid the raid is too, um, for sure. So I, it's going to be an interesting race. I mean, we're already shaping up for this to be a, an exciting one to go down to the wire. Uh, I, I'm not panicking on the Chiefs nor am I the Chargers either. It's just two really, really good football teams going at it, and the Ravens uh, had the best of them on this day. Uh, We may very well see these two at it again in the near future. Cardinals on the road against uh, another AFC North team in the Cleveland Browns. The Cardinals, uh, I mean, we say it every week. It's just that this offense is absolutely unstoppable. I mean, they play good defenses so far this season, and they're not skipping a beat. 37-14 to win over Cleveland a lot of issues with Cleveland were kind of exposed here you know like we we talked about it how how much uh they have relied on the run game and it's been phenomenal but no Nick Chubb in this one Kareem Hunt uh ends up getting injured as well he now is likely going to miss at least three weeks uh and and probably will be put on IR we'll see but some of those issues came to the forefront and when Baker Mayfield needed to pass a lot in this game being down uh, they just weren't able to get over that hump. And meanwhile, Arizona's just sitting there uh, doing what Arizona does. And and now they're the only undefeated team in the league, 6-0. and I don't know what's going on, but they are atop the NFC West still. And it's, it, it's seeming difficult to find out how this team is going to be losing games because, uh, you know, their defense is playing well too, Mark. So I, I admit, I'm, you know, you know, if you've been listening to the show, I've been one of those calling the Cardinals kind of a fraud for undefeated team. This was a massively impressive win for the Cardinals. No head coach, no offensive coordinator. Their offensive line coach was calling the plays because the bullshit COVID protocols the NFL has. Listen, I'm all for keeping players safe, but this is one of those where you're like, wait, 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 this is fucking dumb. Like, that's the only way to say it. Like the, the amount, like he's, uh, he's a coach that has gotten uh, vaccinated and a booster shot, zero symptoms and was testing negative, but had one, t- like, it was just like, no, 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 this is stupid that he's away from the team in this way. Then the NFL, they don't work at, I don't want to say too much of the weeds. Anyways, they're without their head coach, without their offensive coordinator. And they go on the road to a desperate Cleveland team that just felt like they got screwed out of a victory. And I don't want to hear what the injuries, Cleveland fans. Everyone's dealing with injuries. It's the yeah. NFL. Everyone's got to deal with injuries through the year. You may have more injuries than the next team. SOL, you got to play. To, you got to play what we got. And next man up. And you got to. This is the, what makes the NFL so great. And having the depth and having the game plans. The Browns got to be a, in a little bit of a worry right now. A little bit of a panic mode because the AFC and these races for the wild cards are going to start to heat up. And if you're the Browns, you're now, uh, you lost your identity a little bit running the football. Baker was bad. That's the only way to put it. I don't want to be too hard on Baker. I could sit here and just rip Baker apart. He was bad. I'll just leave it at that. If you're the Cardinals, that's an impressive win. And I know it's weird to think it's an impressive to beat the Browns, but that's how good this Browns talent is and how highly I think of Kevin Stefanski. So uh, all in all, I, I will get to it in the Super Bowl plane, but my thoughts on the Cardinals have changed kind of dramatically in one week. Uh, this certainly was an impressive win. Well, and I know it's Kyler Murray, but with the Browns defensive line and obviously having Miles Garrett there, yeah, you figured they would be able to give this offense some fits and put a little more pressure on Kyler. And instead uh, they're able to go off and the rest is history. Now uh, cruising to that six and zero start. And uh, yeah, meanwhile, the, the Browns, um, in a tough spot right now, and it's hard to see uh, where things are going. They said Chubb, it, they're hopeful Chubb will be back this week, but if he's not, you got no Chubb, no Hunt, and all of a sudden, you know, your biggest asset is uh, is now not there. 
Yeah. What do you do? That it's Baker time. This is his time to show it for sure. And he's in a contract here, so good luck. This is it. This is it. Raiders on the road at the Broncos. AFC West showdown here. And uh, the Raiders come out victorious by 10, 34 to 24. Teddy Bridgewater with an uncharacteristic four turnovers in this one, three of which came not in garbage time. Uh, So that was a big concern and probably the deciding factor in what was otherwise a close game. Meanwhile, Derek Carr making incredible throws in this one. He's just, he's been perpetually underrated uh, and ends up carrying his team to victory here. What, what stood out to you in this win, if anything, uh, from the Raiders? Derek Carr has a chance. What it stood out to me is the fact that you're now realizing that Derek Carr has a chance to earn another big contract with the Raiders and be a stabilizing force for an organization right now that really needs it. Um, listen, he's he has an opportunity, like we just said, with Baker in front of him, very different circumstances, but he has an opportunity right now to really – become the complete face of this franchise and to have the franchise rally around him and to lead them. Uh, Very impressed with the Raiders by doing this. I for sure thought the Raiders were going to have a nice first quarter, like emotional boost. We're all in this together, but then the Broncos would really kind of play defense, strangle, hold them and win this game in a low scoring kind of a dud of a game. So that they completely blew me away. Expectation wise, very impressed by the Raiders. We'll see if this is just a one game bump or is this a momentum thing? Can they really lead it? And can, can Derek Carr, like I said, uh, really uh, earn a lot of respect in this league? Cause he's uh, certainly been playing uh, terrific football this year. As far as the Broncos go, I mean, they are literally the AFC uh, Panthers right now. They, they, they are just in a tailspin. Things just aren't going right. The things you thought would go right for them aren't, the things that uh, they they should have control over, they don't. Um, and it just goes to show you, if you're the Broncos, as much as you you I think you made the right decision with Teddy Bridgewater, you're in a you're in a, a little bit of a, a tailspin here right now. And and again, kind of like we talked about Washington, I'll give them another week or two. But if if you don't write the ship in the next two weeks. Then you got to pick the lane. Which lane are you going in? Are you going in stay competitive to try and attract a veteran free agent or a trade partner? You want, you want, because right now, if you're Deshaun Watson, and again, I hate talking about Deshaun Watson so much. I'm just using the name. All right. And right now, if you're an Aaron Rodgers, if you're an elite quarterback who may be on the move, Denver's still a lot more appealing than Miami right now. It's an and attractive spot, no question. It's an, and 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 there's and that what I'm talking about is like the you're and if you're Broncos fan, you say no, 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 we should lose games, get a first round pick higher in the first round. The, For who? the quarterback <laughs> talent is right now is not looking good in this year's no. draft. And there's something to be said about being the most attractive destination and winning football games. So they're looking better than the Washingtons, than the Miamis, than the Houston's, who are all going to be in the quarterback market. I'd argue they're close with Pittsburgh. I mean, it, it's Pittsburgh and, and Denver are the two closest attractive, you know, maybe destinations where you have an opening. So they got to pick that lane. Bad showings can do this to them. You know what I mean? You're saying to yourself, well, Mark, why are you talking about Denver's future? There's still a lot of games on. But when you have bad showings like this, that's where my brain goes. It goes to now a franchise that's in a little bit of a limbo picking a lane. So they have a next, they have a couple of weeks. I'll give them two to three more weeks to figure out what lane they're getting. in. And I think the pendulum has swung back to where it was uh, preseason, where we thought Vic Fangio was like one of the leading candidates to be on the chopping block. They have that three and zero start and you're like, okay, no way. But now they they're in this collapse. Yeah. And now you're once again saying, well, if they continue down this, this road, Pick the lane. then we're right back where we're at. So, and and I think the uh, comparison to the Panthers is pretty uh, spot on. Really talented defense, got a lot of weapons on offense, just question marks, though, on that side of the football. And so, you know, that's kind of where we stand right now with these two teams, both of them also starting 3-0 and and now, you know, having uh, issues. Dan, you're close to the Panthers, so, because I, so I want your thoughts on this, because you would say that, yeah, I agree, there's a lot of comparisons. I think the main difference, though, is I do feel like there's the seat is not hot at all for Matt Rule. No, no. But could you imagine a scenario where the seat does get hot for Matt Rule? Not this year, because I think 
with a brand new quarterback into the fold and with, you know, who knows when McCaffrey's actually going to be back and, and how healthy he is, there will be plenty to show like, Hey, like this guy didn't really get a fair shake this year. He yeah. had the greatest player on the team, uh, you know, out for an extended period of time, brand new quarterback trying to get adjusted to things. You know, the defense has been performing well. So, and they progressed as a team overall, I think you could say that. So yeah, right now I, you know, it's hard to envision a scenario. I mean, I guess if they lose out, you could always yeah, say, I mean, all right, I mean, then, then that's uh, problematic, but if they, even if they get to six, seven wins more than last year, I think that uh, he keeps his job at least for another season to let them see what they can do. All right. Uh, the Cowboys. Oh, I sh- should say uh, before we, we move on, cause I meant to say this during the Cardinals game. They did make a big trade uh, during this week, which was for Zach Ertz uh, yeah. after Max Williams went down to injury. Um, so that's just wanted to throw that out there. Important to note, uh, they deal a fifth round pick and uh, their sixth round corner from this past year to get Zach Ertz. And now that kind of opens up the playing field for Dallas Goddard in Philly. And now Zach Ertz in an already prolific offense. Not sure how big of a difference this makes for Arizona because there's already a million mouths to feed. But uh, it gives them a guy, a reliable dude that's uh, done it for quite some time. Do you have any, you know, anything to add to the uh, the trade there? Well, yeah, I was going to mention the Super Bowl plane for sure. I I think okay. again, it, it just goes to show I love the Cardinals' mentality about this year, and right. not only you know it's one thing to have the mentality, but they're also especially that win in Cleveland showing that this is a team that feels like they could have a team of destiny type vibe. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's sustainable long term because they have a lot of veterans that they're signing and a lot of guys that aren't going to be there in three years from now, except for like Kyler Murray and, and you'd hope Hopkins, you know, uh, but it, it, it's starting to feel very much so like there's a real momentum building in Arizona. Absolutely. For sure. And uh, they're they're continuing to stack those W's. So uh, he'll be a part of a winning organization here uh, for sure. All right. Uh, Cowboys at the Patriots take uh, this one to overtime. 35-29 victory for Dallas, a big win. Uh, the Patriots definitely, you know, kept this one competitive. It was a back-and-forth first half. New England had the 14-10 lead at the break. Um, there was that controversial no-touchdown call with Dak extending over the goal line. They called it a fumble. Uh, there was that whole thing. But, uh, you know, both teams putting up double-digit points in the fourth quarter to send this into overtime, and uh, the Cowboys end up pulling this one out. You'll take the win any way you can get it, Mark. And, you know, obviously the Patriots have, uh, you know, not been the greatest team in the league, but for the Cowboys to get a win any way they could against a talented defense, I think it just still shows that Dallas is finding ways to win the games and uh, really stay, you know, firmly in that dominant spot atop the NFC East. Yeah, I I, I got to be honest, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm caught off guard with this game. I firmly expected this yeah. to be, the week where um, the Cowboys get exposed a little bit because of the discipline play of the Patriots. I thought they would really control the clock, control the ball, no turnovers. And it turns into this wild game with these big touchdown plays. And di- listen, Diggs is phenomenal. Uh, the kid so is good. just well, it's six interceptions. And in, in, uh, I think it's up to seven, seven, seven in you know, six games. I mean, it's just, uh, he's having one of those magical seasons. I don't think he's going I don't think he's Deion Sanders. I don't think you should write him into the Hall of Fame, but he is having a hot season. And it, now if he could put two or three of these together, that's when you start talking about like, wow, this is Darrell Revis type stuff in his right. prime. Like uh, a I lot wanna... of people were talking on Twitter about it, um, comparing him to Jameis Winston's 30 30 season, because while Diggs has had a dominant like interception season, he's also given up like a ton of big plays yes. at, at random times. So he they're like, it's, the it's both end of the uh, spectrum there, which is interesting because like, it's an interesting comparison. I will say this. I tend to what I would tend to think as long as my corner is making the big plays, I'm yeah. okay with them giving up the big plays in a lot of ways with the way the NFL is right now, aggressive corners and getting interceptions, getting turnovers. You know, it's kind of like um, in baseball where it's like launch angles. I'd right. rather be hitting home runs and striking out. You know what I mean? Like you, you just almost have to trust the numbers in that way. The, this, the league favors the offense so much. The one thing the defense can do is get turnovers. And if you're getting turnovers, I would rather and take scoring. That. Yeah, I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd rather take that if that means you're giving up a couple big plays as well. So it is a 50-50, but I do like that comparison in a lot of ways. It's kind of funny. 
Um, I, I'll say this. I'm, I will talk about Dallas a little bit more in the Super Bowl plane. So I'll, I'll focus a little more on New England. I, credit to Mac Jones. Uh, I thought he was more impressive in this game because they were, I felt like they were letting him take more shots. I'm okay with Mac Jones throwing interceptions. I'm okay with rookie quarterbacks making mistakes. They got to learn. It felt like for the first time, though, that offense really said to themselves, we know we got to score to beat Dallas. And so seeing that growth was an exciting thing if I was a Patriots fan, even in a loss. Yeah, and they took them to the wire all throughout the game. I mean, we talk about that first half, 14-10 lead at the break. If you're New England, you're loving that. I mean, you held them to 10 points. Obviously, they got their points in the second half and in overtime, but these are these are good things for a New England team where you can say we can look at a couple of these you know moments and say this is great stuff to build off of and that's really all you can ask for a team that I know they expect it uh, postseason but I don't think most people expect a postseason berth from yeah. New England this year and if they do get there they'll you know limp in uh, as a wild card team and, and probably go one and out or uh, one and done but. Uh, it, it's something to build off of. And I think that that is encouraging. Meanwhile, uh, another good win for Dallas, you know, Dak, despite throwing 51 times and uh, what was it? 400 yards. Yeah. 445 yards. Typically you don't win those games. They found a way to win it. And so, uh, you know, good news there for Dallas and, uh, and the Cowboys getting a win there. Finally, the Sunday night game Seahawks at the Steelers, uh, a, a sloppy game, a wild game, an crazy entertaining finish. game, a crazy yeah. finish, like a lot of stuff here. Um, Steelers win an OT on a uh, Chris Boswell field goal to make it 23 to 20. They moved to 500. Obviously, Seahawks without Russell Wilson in this one. They had backup uh, running back and Alex Collins as well. Collins had a big day. I mean, the Steelers were gouged in the run game, especially in the second half. Uh, so it was an interesting dynamic, a tale of two halves really in this game. You know, Steelers were up 14-0, uh, you know, had all of the momentum. The Seahawks in the second half able to kind of, uh, you know, come back, make this competitive, tie it up. Uh, really, Mark, obviously the, the keys to this game were T.J. Watt, uh, seven tackles, two sacks, a forced fumble, three pass deflections, a couple of them coming on third down, three tackles for loss. I mean, he, he's he's dominant, the best defensive player in the league, in my opinion, and he made the big play when they needed it in overtime to set Pittsburgh up with an opportunity to get that game winning field goal. And they did uh, obviously got to mention the horrific incident that happened yeah. in this game. Terrifying. Daryl Taylor uh, gets, gets hit. It looked like he ran, you know, trying to make a tackle runs into his own lineman and his, you know, neck gets accordion there. He was on the ground. They bring the stretcher out. Good news today. They said that the CT scans were negative. He is moving his extremities. So it looks like he avoided any, like, you know, obviously worst case scenario of paralysis or anything like that. But uh, obviously a terrifying, um, you know, instance, and you never like to see that. Uh, so that obviously put a damper on the evening for sure. Uh, but the Steelers, you know, end up um, uh, overcoming a lot of obstacles uh, to win this one 23-20. Yeah, glad to hear the report this morning about how he's doing it was one of those, you know, as soon as you watch it, you know, immediately you see those, the way yeah. that neck moves and you're just like, yep, 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 yep. Like that's, that's what the NFL is continuing, continuing to try to make sure happens less and less and less. And I do think overall, um, I was, when I was uh, watching even bears Packers, yeah, you know, yesterday and Justin Fields takes the hit when he was doing the slide, you still think to yourself man, the NFL's just come so far in the last 20 years of you eliminating those massive hits, but those, that accordion neck, uh, it, it just, yeah, gruesome, but glad to hear the reports doing well. I will say this about the game. I, I got, I hated the Steelers play calling in the second half. Yeah. Uh, it's maddening. It's, it's maddening to watch. And it, it's just one of those times where it's like, I know I'm not smarter. I'm a fan. I know I'm not smarter than NFL coaches. But there's just sometimes you're just like, what in the Lord's name are you doing? Like it, it, it just, and sometimes I do think NFL guys are so insular and they don't step out enough to, to just, to just like put themselves in like common sense mode sometimes that they could maybe do that could maybe do them. Uh, some smart good. themselves sometimes. I agree. Right? Uh, Matt know? Nagy is the king of that, but I will say this for the Steelers overall. This is, we talked about a couple weeks ago. This is how the Steelers are going to win games. Yeah. They're going to have to win games with defensive plays. 
They're going to have to win games to the wire. They're going to have to win games wonky if they want a chance to get into the playoffs. They're putting themselves in that position with the win. Uh, so credit to them. And for Seattle, I can only – the, the first thought it came into my head when DK Metcalf stays in bounds and lose that ball is, is if Russell Wilson was in that huddle, he would have said to DK, he would have given that reminder. Everyone out, out of bounds. bounds. Yeah. Like I, that's the only way I could think of because DK, I don't think DK is a dumb player, but that was like dumb, dumb, dumb move, like all time bonehead play. And I think part of that is adrenaline. You're trying to get back into the game. And I just don't know if Gino or anyone else in that huddle gave that reminder of get out of bounds, catch the ball, get out of bounds. Can and I, I play like- devil's advocate real quick yeah. on that one though? Yeah, I think I truly think DK thought he could score on that play. I think he saw an opportunity. Maybe he he had one DB to beat and that DB ended up punching the ball out. I mean, if, if, if he doesn't win on that punch, he probably doesn't get the tackle and DK might be off to the races down the sidelines and and get the game winning touchdown instead of what they ended up having to settle for the uh, game tying field goal. I'm just saying like, I could see, that now, now, granted, you're playing with fire, obviously making that yeah. decision. So there is there is that. To your devil's advocate would be, I still believe if Russell Wilson was in the huddle and said, we yes. don't need, like, don't try to do too much. Don't catch play the hero ball, ball. Get out of bounds. Yeah, catch the ball, get out of bounds. And Russell Wilson uh, was was on the side. Like, he jumped onto the field well, after the play. It was a very was much a Russell Wilson show. And and, yeah. and then, you know what? It's, it's <laughs> I do love, you know how much I love Russell Wilson, the player. The dude is a little much. He's a little, I, he, oh, you know, sure. you know me and who I, yeah, he's a little much. Um, I think it was like the part of my take Twitter that tweeted out like the video of him with, you know, doing the pregame, like in the fake huddle. And it was like 10% luck, 15% skill, you know, the, the, the JJ Watt <laughs> concentrated power of will. Yeah. yeah like, yeah. it's like, come on, dude. I like, it's a little much, but I do love Russell Wilson. Either way. I thought great win for the Steelers. Because this is how the Steelers are going to win games this year. If they get to nine and eight and make the playoffs, it's because they're going to win nine games. Like, how the did they win that game? That was crazy. And a lot of it's going to be because T.J. Watt. And I do think, listen, it's hard for T.J. Watt because Khalil Mack's having an all-time great year. Aaron Donald's still Aaron Donald. Uh, There, You know, a guy like Diggs is having an incredible year defensively. I think, though, T.J. Watt can make his case to be defensive player of the year this year over any of those guys because he's going to he's gonna literally show the offensive film versus what right. he does to win games. And uh, he may not have the stats to everyone else, but T.J., the, the reason the Steelers are winning games right now is a lot because of T.J. Watt. Uh, he showed it last night in prime time. Absolutely. No, it's a huge win. They go three and three, and they have a bye this week. So it's yeah. – you, you don't want to Reset. go into a buy having to fester on a loss for an extended amount of time, let alone have to sit on a loss when you're in the position that they're in. So get back to 500, two wins in a row, got to buy. You can start to, to, you know, get this train moving, get healthy. A lot of opportunities here for Pittsburgh, but they're going to have to show it after the buy. They're going to have to get a couple more wins here, go on a win streak and, yep. and really be convincing. We'll stick with this game for our bold strategy as we end our week six recap uh, because we kind of alluded to it there with the DK Metcalf not going out of bounds. For those that don't know, we'll, we'll set the stage real quick. Uh, DK Metcalf catches the pass from Geno Smith on the left sideline with about 10 seconds to go, tries to make a play, gets tackled in, or they punch the ball out. Uh, Freddie Swain falls on it, instantly gets up. They run to the line, spike the ball with one second left on the clock. But – the refs are blowing the play dead because they wanted to review it and uh, make sure that he had possession of the ball. DK did when he caught it. Well, and it, they said like they wanted to make sure he caught it in bounds. In bounds, didn't step out of bounds. Yes. And, and and the whole fumble, they wanted to, to look at the whole play. Mike Tomlin and company very pissed about that decision uh, because obviously when you're in a heated moment like that, the momentum is on the defensive side. You're yes. putting the offense in a chaotic situation. They had to run back. They barely got the spike in time. And then they would have had to trot the field goal unit out in a high pressure situation. Instead, the stoppage of play gives the, you know, the whole crew three five minutes to sit there and, and discuss and, and calm down and, and think about things. Tomlin was pissed. Anyway, the bold strategy here is after the game, 
Mike Tomlin, who often doesn't really get into things very much, keeps a lot of things close to the vest, very coach speak, sounded off on the officiating in this one saying, quote, I hated it. I hated it. I cannot believe that game was stopped to confirm a catch, no catch in that moment. That's all I'm going to say. And then he finished with, quote, it's an embarrassment or it was an embarrassment, end quote. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. Big time uh, statement from Mike Tomlin. He doesn't say many things because for those of you that know, the NFL does not condone, uh, you know, getting in the way of the officials talking about the officiating in any sense. Mike Tomlin surely probably having a fine come his way, but he clearly thought this is a time for me to speak up and is willing to take that chance. Yeah. Oh, he'll pay his $50,000 fine. And I think with a smile knowing that it, he he's right. I mean, he's absolutely right. And I think this again is another one of those microcosms for the whole season. There, there has been a lot of bad officiating this season. I, and I know, I think, I feel like we say that a lot, but I do feel this year. It's unique. It, it is very, unique. It's unique. Year. And, and the chorus of people who care about the NFL who and who watch every game, the Warren Sharps on Twitter that you follow, these guys who are, uh, I mean, we all trust them for their opinions. They're echoing it loud and, and clearly as well. The Kevin Clarks, the, you know, the Ringer and all these people, they are, they're on it too. And those are guys who normally would say, all right, calm down. These calls go this way, these calls. But they're echoing how bad the officiating has been this year as well. And listen, Mike Tomlin's very well respected in the league. And I credit a guy like Mike Tomlin for being so, first of all, being right, in my opinion, of just how ridiculous it was and the, the shift of momentum and all the stuff that went into it, but and having a right to be upset. But I also think when Mike Tomlin speaks very clearly like that, listen, the league listens. They know. Yeah. They understand. So I really do hope the NFL, uh, they, they, they calm down a little bit and realize that with the way gambling's going, with the way the NFL is being, you know, they're already taking so much of the violence out of the game. You have got to let these guys play a little bit more. And you take these ticky tacky uh, roughing the passer calls out, take the taunting out and, and, and give the refs a, a better ability to control the game in the end of game situations like that without losing control to have to gain control. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's important to know, too, that Tomlin's on the competition committee. He is. Uh, and, and, and so I think his words carry even more weight in that regard because he's in on those discussions during the offseason about what they're going to do as a league about the rules moving forward. So uh, a big statement by him. And, uh, yeah, I agree, too. I think he was right uh, because, as we know, you know, they would have been able to spike the ball anyway. I mean, they barely got it off, but they yeah. got it off in time, and they would have been able to kick the field goal, but – as we know, kickers, it's all about a mental game. And so when you're a kicker being forced into a situation, uh, there's a little bit more anxiety than when on you the get road. five minutes to sit there and stew on what you have to, you know, uh, perform in front of you. All right. So that should do it there for our week six recap. Now it's time for the Super Bowl playing update, as we do every week now throughout the rest of the, the season. Mark, uh, what you got for us here? Yeah, well, uh, Dan, the Super Bowl plane has left Charlotte. It has arrived in New York. It's New York. Yeah, I feel like Michael Scott being to go to Sabaro. You're going to go to Sabaro. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, there you go. And, uh, a, but a fine I, New York slice. Exactly. I, I think this week there's some real clarity now as far as first class goes. Um, I, their only change to first class this week was uh, a getting rid of the Chargers and upgrading the Cardinals. And I think it's the smart move. It's the right move. Um, and I think, again, the Chargers deserve to get downgraded because in order to be a team that I believe can win the Super Bowl, they didn't have to win that game in, in Baltimore, but they got they got exposed, and they got exposed for and a reminder to all of us, smack, you know, clarity brain, rookie head coach, second-year young quarterback, big-time game on the road. They just looked a little overwhelmed in the moment. And that happens. That's okay. I think, though, Super Bowl-capable teams, though, don't get overwhelmed in those moments, especially maybe in week one, fine. The Packers losing to the Saints, all the stuff that went into that game played in Jacksonville. I think we got more clarity on that now. The Bills losing to the, the Steelers, we have more clarity on that now. 
But by week six, if you want to be a Super Bowl team, that those type of things don't happen. So the Chargers take a step back for now. They have plenty of time to get back into first class. But the Bills, Ravens, Packers, Bucks, Rams, all there, all stayed there, no changes. Even with the Bills playing tonight, Monday Night Football, I think they'll take care of the Titans pretty easily. Cardinals get the bump up. I The Cardinals had a real test, and I thought they hit a massive home run. Everything going against them, you we talked about it earlier. Adding Ertz as well, I think, will be great for them. Their mentality is all in. They're playing all in. And uh, Kyler Murray's been terrific, uh, and he deserves a lot of credit. Business class, these are the teams you know that I think can win multiple playoff games. But as of right now, I haven't seen enough from them consistently to say I feel like they can win a Super Bowl. That's the Chargers. They get the bump down. The Cowboys, I know a lot of people are going to hate on me for that, that they should be in first class. But again, I just don't know yet about the Cowboys. I've just been too burned by the Cowboys in the past. I do not trust Mike McCarthy yet. Everything else I like about the Cowboys, and they're going to keep stacking wins because their schedule's really easy, but I don't know yet if that means they are a Super Bowl team. And the Chiefs, great win, right the ship. They're not yet back. That defense still is way too shaky. Mahomes is turning the ball over way too much for me to confidently say they belong in first class with the other teams. Stand by. These are teams I think could upset and maybe win a playoff game, but certainly right now look like playoff teams. Bengals, very feisty, the Bengals. They stay in standby from last week. Titans, they stay in standby from last week. Again, depending on what happens, if they get blown out tonight at home, they could be kicked out of standby. And then the Raiders. The Raiders get brought back into standby. Uh, listen, I, I think that was an impressive Raiders win. The, the world is collapsing around them. Derek Carr looked great uh, on the road against a very good defense. Now, the Raiders could certainly sneaky have an upset in a, in a first round of the NFL playoffs. Sure. That's the Super Bowl playing for this week, Dan. Fantastic. Love it. We're going to look forward to those updates every week. But that will do it for our week six recap episode here on the Football Lounge. Thank you all for listening and watching. Please like, subscribe. If you're watching us on YouTube, check us out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all of that good stuff. At Mark Hespin, at Dan Vasco, at FB Lounge Pod is the show on Twitter. Please give us a shout out there if you want to give us your thoughts. Uh, real quick, Mark, you mentioned it. You got the Bills tonight. I have the Bills yeah. tonight. Do you have the Bills minus six? Yeah, why not? Yeah. I, I think, I, I, you know, I just don't trust Tennessee's defense at all. I think Tennessee offensively will play better tonight. They'll look good but I, at home, but I, I just don't trust their defense. To the, All it takes is, with six points, all it takes is a Josh Allen touchdown late in a close game, and you, yeah. and you cover that, and I think that's certainly a possibility. Slight look ahead to Thursday night. Broncos at the Browns. Browns getting three and a half points. Tough one. They're both coming off a rough loss. God, this is a big game for both teams. Huge. Broncos at the Browns. Uh, I would. I will take the Browns. I think that they're the yeah. way more desperate at this moment. Yep, I would agree too. I think they uh, they got to have a rebound game. Kevin yeah, that's a huge will be back. game. All of a huge game. That's a huge game. All of a sudden. Yep. Only a few days away. Short week for both teams, obviously. Yep. And uh, yeah, the dog pound probably be rocking there Thursday night. All right. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you back here next week.